December 13th. The shelter provided a roof over her head, but also water, food, and vitamins. This was a relief for April. Because they were able to give out these supplies, this reduced the chance for violent outbursts among the patrons. While everyone was eating, there was a radio update from the DCD in Sierra, confirming that the virus was indeed engineered, and that it was likely a terrorist attack, spread on dollar bills most likely during Black Friday. Also, the president is alive, and releases a statement on the radio. It's taken several weeks, but finally everyone now knows what they're up against. April went on to find one of Bill's co-workers, Miko. He worked with her at SPGX. This was her last option of where she could go outside of the various shelters around the city. April only knew where Miko lived because of a party she attended a year or so ago. After a bit of a hike, April made it to Miko's safely. This area was considered to be one of the safer areas in Manhattan at this time. There was a local gang leader who was protecting the area, and keeping it somewhat safe from the other hostile factions. As an added bonus, Miko's place still had power. After the last couple of days, I didn't expect anything good to happen, but it did. Miko was there. She recognized me, and she let me in. They live on the third floor and still have electricity. I'm writing now by the light of an actual electrical bulb. <laughs> Amazing how quickly that starts to seem unusual. Miko's partner, Drew, is a nurse. He's got some incredible stories about the first days of the bug. Neither of them can believe he's still alive. Every so often, while he's telling his stories, Miko will just reach out and touch him, like she wanted to make sure he was really there. I wish I could reach out and touch Bill. Miko lived with her boyfriend Drew, who was a nurse that survived the initial outbreak of the virus. April asked Drew to share everything he knew about the virus. The hospitals were overwhelmed by the second or third day. Patients lined the hallways on makeshift beds, and staff were working in 24-hour shifts. The hospital he was working at was also losing two to three staff members per day. April spent the next couple of days scavenging the city. On her way back to Miko's, April came across several crews that were starting to barricade a large area of the city, and she was on the wrong side of the barricade. April was in the middle of what would be soon known as the Dark Zone. The crews wouldn't let her leave the area. She was beginning to worry about how she was going to escape. Certain checkpoints had been set up. They were only allowing emergency vehicles to pass through. Fortunately for April, she managed to find an ambulance driver who was willing to smuggle her out for a fee. April gave the driver the last of her money, and once they had passed through the barricades, she was dropped off at 23rd Ave, where the SBGX lab building is located. April hadn't been back to this area since she watched her husband being gunned down. Eventually she worked up the courage to go inside and collect some of Bill's things from his desk. Maybe she'd be lucky and find something that could explain what happened to him. April found some belongings, pictures, and also a comic book card. On the comic book card there was some writing. Neither snow nor rain will stop Dr. Lou. After grabbing everything, she went back to Drew and Miko's house. Over the next few days, there continued to be riots, including one at the post office where it was rumoured that Sarah had stockpiles of food and vaccines. Eventually, to disperse the people, tear gas and gunfire were used. There were also rumours going around saying that the virus has killed more than 5 million people in the United States, and more than 50 million people worldwide. April, Miko and Drew kept a fairly low profile over the next little while. However, eventually their supplies started to run low. But Drew had a plan. The nearby towers were full of supplies, and he proposed that they enter these buildings to loot the goods that they needed. April was against this. The book specifically stated to stay out of high-rise towers. They are essentially death traps if you run into the wrong people. While it was agreed that it would be risky, Drew still convinced Miko and April that this was needed to be done if they were to survive. Despite the warnings of the survival guide, Drew picked out a building. It was a new high-end luxury apartment complex that was mostly used as vacation homes for the wealthy. Drew said it should mostly be abandoned, and that they should easily be able to run through and grab any supplies that were left behind. You're sure this place is empty? We've scoped it out. If we're gonna do this, we need to do it now before someone else beats us to it. In and out before sunrise. Just like we planned. Just like we planned. The next day they left the apartment complex. At this time, April notes down in the book that Sarah had started pulling out of New York 
and that the JTF were now having to fight off gangs and other hostile factions. When they made it to the complex, they were easily able to enter without being seen. They then began to work their way up through the building, looting whatever they could find. As they got higher into the complex, the smell of dead bodies filled the air. Regardless, they continued to make their way up to the 29th floor, where they ended up settling for the night. They found a room where they could sleep with their newly acquired supplies, including aspirin, camping gear, and boots. Before they called it a night, they turned on the radio to see if they could gain any information on what was happening in the outside world. But before they knew it, they were falling asleep, exhausted from their day's looting. However, this was a huge mistake on their part. Hearing the noise of the radio, men in orange jumpsuits broke into the room where Drew, Miko and April were sleeping, and started firing their weapons. Drew and Miko were immediately shot dead. But once again, April was left alive. They had other plans for her. After being knocked out, April woke, tied to a chair. Straight away she noticed that she was in a different apartment. April would find out that the men in orange jumpsuits were escaped convicts from Rikers Island. They were rummaging through her belongings, and she was concerned about what they would do next. Suddenly, another man entered the room. He looked like he could have been part of the JTF, but there was something different about him. He was wearing civilian clothes, instead of the usual JTF attire, and seemed strangely calm considering how outnumbered he was against the Rikers. The man swiftly cleared the apartment of the Rikers, quickly killing them where they stood. Unfortunately, during the gunfight, he also took several bullets, which caused him to collapse to the ground shortly after. April was still tied in the chair, but she could see that the man was now lying on the floor, conscious but bleeding out. Rocking her chair back and forth until it tipped over, she was able to cut herself free using a knife that fell during the fight. She then crawled over to him and looked him straight in the eyes as he was fading away and thanked him for saving her life. The man that saved her life reminded her of another person she saw in the back of an ambulance ride and she begins to suspect that there is a secret society of vigilante heroes. Eventually April figures out that he was a member of the division because of his backpack. The agent that saved her life was Doug Sutton. He was a member of Noble Squad, who was avenging the rest of his squad that were killed by this group of Rikers. As far as rescuing April, he was merely in the right place, at the right time. Before she left, she grabbed everything she could, which included Doug's backpack, with all of his supplies, rifle, and pistol. December 25th. This day was by far the hardest for April. She spent Christmas Day locked away mourning the loss of her friends and husband. At this point she was hoping that this entire thing was just a dream, and that she would just wake up from this nightmare. December 26th. Pulling herself together, April gave herself new motive to continue pushing on through this disaster, to find out why her husband died. April began to further investigate the book, looking for hidden messages in an attempt to find out what happened. She set out to find this Dr. Lou that came from the comic book card that Bill had written on. The reference neither snow nor rain relates to the United States Postal Creed, so the post office was April's first stop to get some answers. Dr. Lou is set up in the infirmary at the post office. When April confronts him, he recognizes her and takes her to a private area. The doctor explains that as far as he knew, they were researching cures to the virus based off the existing biotech programs, but denies knowing who Bill is. April is skeptical and feels that she isn't getting the full story, but he sends her on her way while saying that alliances are shifting and to trust no one. When April left the post office, she came across another division agent. He asked how the war was going. April swears that he could tell that she wasn't a division agent. This encounter scares her. When she returns home, she starts to consider what she should do with the agent backpack. She doesn't want to be forced into combat or to be thought of as a thief. Before going to sleep, April starts to feel quite unwell. She suspects that she may have caught the virus, but it's been close to a month since the outbreak. Surely at this stage she is immune. But as she finds over the next few days, this isn't the case. And after witnessing her friend Eva slowly die from it, she knows what she's about to face. Alone. 